Hello, friends, and welcome to episode four of the Academic Gamer Podcast. I am your host, Robert C. Gray, a PhD student of new media and a researcher of video games, coming at you through the former to talk about the latter. And today, we're sitting in early 2019. It's already off to a great start in the world of gaming, and we're going to take some time to talk about some of the games on the horizon this year that we're most excited about. And it's not early 2019. It is. Yeah. It's, it's February. That's almost March. two of 12 months. That's Cosmic. totally fine. We're still in the first quarter. First 25%. That's early. Yeah, it's Q1, and, bros. First and early adoption honest. territory of 2019. There's only one game that has come out this year that matters so far. So um, I think we're okay. What game is that? Which, which game is we'll that? We'll get to it in a second. G- but with me today is our resident game developer, Mr. Timothy Day. What's going on, Tim? What up? And our resident musician who can't carry a beat, Jared Newton. How's it going, Jared? That's true. I, I'm, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm, it's good to be here, Gray. I'm good to be back. <laughs> you feel welcome. Um, <laughs> and we also have uh, this one dude that corporate sent down, um, says he works in PR, Mr. Troy Edwards. Is this where we smash the subscribe button? Yes. Smash, subscribe, smash hit, hit the likes and the comments. Um, if I'm going all corporate. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, maybe subscribe. Oh, well, you know, that that is a good segue into it. Um, you know, for those out there who are reaching us through iTunes or some other podcast app, it's great to have our audio listeners. Uh, but uh, we also publish on YouTube. And for this, I'm probably just going to have some, uh, I don't know, Apex Legends gameplay on top of it, uh, which we'll, we'll get to in a Even minute. Everyone else. Uh-huh. But... <laughs> <Some> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, definitely go check out the YouTube channel, uh, search for Academic Gamer. In addition to the podcast, we're also pushing some annotated gameplay videos and other adventures of our gaming group. Um, So check them out. And as Troy said, like, subscribe, all that. Uh, And if you're out there listening, just, you know, hey, let us know. Our Twitter is uh, at Academic Gamer. Send email to academicgamer at outlook.com. And for those, uh, I guess, who have been tracking our Game of the Year discussion, I can already hear Tim groaning, uh, but yes, the game of the year for 2018. <laughs> we uh, we did get to deliberations on that. Unfortunately, thanks to some free open source tools that we were using, we got some bad audio. Sabotage. We were not able to recover it. The tools and not uh, the user of the tools. Mm. Yep. Um, no, there's probably a little bit of user error, but uh, we're just going to... Tools on tools violence. <laughs> kind of briefly... <laughs> touch on that uh you know wrap wrap up the storyline right um so if you guys remember um our list at number one we had dead cells uh number two god of war and number three zelda breath of the wild which may sound a little weird um to somebody not familiar with our process but uh, it's not just the games that were like really well executed last year but also the games that were meaningful to our group uh, our, our social gaming group trinity Uh, And so Dead Cells kind of won out there in the end because uh, though God of War is a fantastic game and and deserves to be in the top three of any uh, game of the year discussion, Dead Cells really hit our group hard. Like there were there were some game nights Mm -hmm. where we just had somebody play and stream on Twitch and like the rest of us just jumped on Discord and watched the Twitch stream and cheered them on. Um, And that was that was really cool. Uh, God of War, of course, is an amazing game. And Zelda Breath of the Wild, though, it was a 2017 game. Our group was a little late in picking up our switches. Uh, most of us ended up playing it over the course of last year. And uh, yeah, I mean, that that could just be on my game of the year list uh, every year going forward. And um, we also have, uh, to round out the top 10, a uh, couple more games, seven more in no particular order. We had Red Dead Redemption 2, Seven Days to Die, Subterfuge, Celeste, Marvel's Spider-Man, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, and Monster Hunter World. You said Spider-Man, right? I did. I did. I could even hear the dash. Yes. <laughs> Spider-Dash man. Wait, I've been trained well. This, uh, what's the semi-dash one? Semi-dash? Semi- What? Oh, semicolon. Semi-colon. That's what I'm thinking about. That's, that's the this? one. This is this is our professional writer. <laughs> PR doesn't write well. <laughs> uh, but we can finally turn our eyes to 2019 we got a handful of games that uh, folks have checked out that i think are going to be pretty cool this year and the first one um i didn't play the first subnautica but subnautica below zero is coming out yeah so 
if we had not done if we had done the podcast a little bit later, Subnautica would have jumped into my last year's ranking, and it has blown me away. Uh, it's basically a full standalone expansion for Subnautica. So we t- was talked a lot about not really liking crafting games last time, and I don't particularly love them either. I think the one that we talked about really liking was Seven Days to Die because of how good the multiplayer was. But Subnautica has just blown me away over the past few weeks. I think the first weekend I fired it up, I logged 10 hours because it takes away and really streamlines the whole crafting progression. So in seven days, you had to go get brass. You had to go mine 50 things to create a hammer that then went way down the tech tree but in subnautica it's just like the curve is just so nice and precise so that you're making really valid progress every i would say 15 to 20 minutes and so below zero is the next entry in the subnautica universe chapter and set in a frozen tundra and i can't wait because i'm almost done with the first one yeah you kind of uh you disappeared there for for a little bit on us (laughs) oh troy's playing playing subnautica (laughs) yeah i'm like at 55 hours in over two or three weeks holy cow are you nearing the end Uh, or are you still is it still going strong so nelson had 75 total hours logged and there is a set start and end point and so i'm at about 55 and he told me that he went about as slow as he can so i kind of think that within the next two play sessions i could be wrapped up damn is there uh when we were talking about um when we were talking about uh, the other one seven days to die and just crafting games in general especially in the context of last year not not to open the wound of game of the year stuff again but uh i mean subnautica is like so much better than anything else we've seen in that genre that uh i don't know it's kind of kind of ridiculous uh, it's definitely it's definitely the one for me as well that I can still get into. Yeah, I really like watery kind of ocean fishing things. And so I already was on the path to liking it before I'd even started playing. But just in general, I mean, that whole... I think when we talk about Breath of the Wild and some of these other games, the whole path of exploration and seeing new areas in the world and just kind of being blown away by that kind of stuff, that really is where Subnautica fits into, just because it's beautiful and also terrifying. Every single time you hear a creature kind of squawk at you in the middle of the night, you're just, I've had my heartbeat racing multiple times when I'm playing, and I don't know, it, it's such a great game right. series, and give me more. Yes, fish squawking. <laughs> yeah the most terrifying of noises uh i i know why you like it you're just role-playing the shape of water the whole time aren't you it, is that um are you that's the fish yeah, movie. best picture oh i thought you were commenting on my body type <laughs> <laughs> um i i don't know a lot about below zero specifically i this is probably the game i like at the least because i kind of like it's a known thing to me I imagine it'll be just, sub- it sounds like it's going to be Subnautica on ice. Basically, yeah. There's like a snowmobile. And so the one of the things, spoilery, is that, you know, in Ocean Planet, there is no land in, in Subnautica, except for two very narrow kind of island things that you find, which are really cool moments in the game. But I think that this one has like more land and ocean mixed together and is set in, you know, frozen wasteland. Hmm. Is it the same planet? Do we even know? The planet is designated like letter, letter, number, letter, and so there are there's another similar naming convention for that, but I don't know whether they're the same or not because I didn't memorize number, number, letter, number. Gotcha. Oh, cool. Uh, next up, we got Kingdom Hearts three, which I know was looked into. So I've already beaten Kingdom Hearts three. Um, so it's weird. To, it's gonna. I'm gonna try and like wind up. But go backwards mentally <laughs> to say why I was excited for Kingdom Hearts 3. Uh, for me, Kingdom Hearts is a series that I've got a lot of nostalgia for. I can remember playing this by passing a controller back and forth with friends. Uh, and, you know, I beat the first Kingdom Hearts that way, beat the second Kingdom Hearts that way. And then I didn't play the series for years until I played the dreadful game on the 3DS Stream Drop Distance. And, ugh. I almost gave up on Kingdom Hearts then, but Kingdom Hearts 3 is finally the third game after 14 years. Been waiting a long time for it. 
so I have been really looking forward to it. Uh, I can even talk a little bit about how it is now if we want to do that. Like, it's a, it's weird finally having the game I've waited for for so long come out. I'm interested in a two-minute recital of the plot. Uh, yeah, the story all makes sense now, right? Darkness, bad, light, good. Oh, so it's Destiny. I have That's not heard Simple that and clean. And That's the plot. <laughs> Alright, um, so with with um without getting too much into the game itself, because it's there's a lot to unpack with it. Having having beaten it, I think the best thing I can say about it is that I am satisfied. I think I'm about as happy with it as I could be given how long it took and how crazy the series has gotten. It has a lot of problems. <laughs> it's it's probably too easy. Uh, I, th I thought it was too easy anyway. Um, it's very back heavy in the difficulty, which is classic Kingdom Hearts to do that, but it was um, it, it didn't quite feel right. I don't know. And the story's still absolutely nonsense, and the fact that I needed to know stuff from a mobile game and from every from like five different platforms is is it's almost unfair to hold it against Kingdom Hearts three specifically. It's more of a problem with the series as a whole, but it rears its head here and comes to a head. Well, that's if good, I to... think, to even just be able to say that you're satisfied with it, because these games, they get super hyped and take that long to come out. Um, usually people aren't satisfied, right. so I think that's a, a credit I, for it. I was super worried about this game. I did not like Final Fantasy XV at all. It's probably one of my least favorite games, and this is like solid and it has some of the same design philosophies actually and it just it, yeah satisfied i think is the best i could have hoped for and that's what i am uh, i think the game could have been a lot better but i'll take it for those of us with children who are in the three to four range who are currently obsessed with the frozen gals how many hours are they in it uh honestly the frozen world's the worst part of the game um, but they do do a really cool, uh, recreation of sim uh, not simple and clean. That's the frozen song, you know, let it go. Let it go. <laughs> I, which I hear uh, seven times a day right now. And, uh, not to, not to get too spoiler on it, but, uh, like they really play into the fact that like, if you were just a fly on the wall watching Disney characters sing all of a sudden, you'd be very confused. And so they have a good bit with Sora Donald and Goofy going, what? What? Who's who is that? Why are they singing? <laughs> kind of breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and the game's super self-aware, which is really great. Like I think that's why I'm satisfied is that they they seem to clearly know how ridiculous it is. So I I don't. I mean, it's they also recognize how ridiculous it is and then do nothing to fix that. So take take from that what you will, I suppose. They are they are committed to what that series is at this point. Well, good. Yeah, I'm glad it uh, glad it worked out. Um, we have next on the list Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Uh, I'm super looking forward to this game. I played the first one. It was the I'd say it's the first game that I like played through all the way um, with my son, who was like three at the time, and he was uh, obsessed with the little white bunny. Um, and I don't know, just really... Is it a bunny? Well, I don't think so, but that's what he called it. <laughs> it's an Ori. It's an Ori. Uh, but yeah, it, it like really good memories there, Saturday mornings and stuff. And I can't wait to go back into that. I mean, the game was beautiful. It controlled really well. Um, and I don't know anything about... like I haven't gone in and watched trailers or whatever. But if they just kind of do more of the same thing, I will be uh, super psyched to play this game. I uh, am right there with you, Gray. I've been s kind of saving it, some of the you know trailers and reading about it, just so that once I buy it, I can enjoy it because the first one was very special. Um, I love the hand-drawn art, the movement, the the platforming, the puzzling. I mean, everything about that game was super fun. Uh, felt really good. And uh, if they do more of the same in terms of scope, I'll be I'll be very happy. Yeah, so when the first one came out, uh, I was working on Fantasy Fairways, which 
It's a game I've made. It's on Steam. People should check it out. Go buy it. Uh, subscribe. Yeah, when when we were working on Fantasy Fairways, uh, when I finally got an artist <laughs> to replace our pixel art, we were trying to find like a direction for the game and uh, Ori and the Blind Forest. We were just like, wow, everything that's 2D needs to look this good. And we didn't get anywhere near emulating their art style completely, but um, man, that game looks real good. I will say... Ori the Mind Forest is when I realized I don't think I like Metroidvanias very much. That, that's uh, okay. Like I didn't actually enjoy playing it that much, and I and I think that's just a personal preference. It's super high quality game, but playing it, I was like, uh, I'm kind of tired of the format. And pretty much every year, I'll, I'll try another one. I, I had the same response with Hollow Knight and stuff like that. It's it's just not my jam, but no, that's fine. I, I think that's that's perfectly uh, all right. I mean, we we can't all be right, so it's it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's true. I think it's interesting you that you can that... play Ori and I'll play Super Mario Odyssey. Well, a game like oh, Ori might be more Metroidvania than a game like Dead Cells, but you know they're both side-scrolling platformers, and one's Game of yeah. the Year and one's not Game of the Year 2019. One's the future Game of the Year. Cells <laughs> is like an action game. Yeah, I, I know, but, you know, left, left, right, up, down. I, you yep, know, just, that's just it. Saying. That's the, the, the exact <laughs> same game. <laughs> we could go further. You're just tapping a button for some feedback. Yeah. In fact, I would go further and say that my hope for the game is that we recategorize it Metroidvania. Oh, like like actually genre busting. Yeah. Well, because to Wes's point, there's a crap ton of games that have been you know tagged that, and I don't think most of them are that memorable. Be it, like they might have like an in, in, interesting move or something like a slight tweak, but the way Ori differentiated to me was just like how hard the movement was relative to those other games and in addition to like the awesome art style on top of it like i felt like i was becoming a better player as i was playing those games whereas if you look back at metroid and all that other kind of stuff, which was like the best the game of my childhood it, i didn't really get better at gaming per se playing it for the most part oh i'm super interested to see what the response to will of the wisps will be i, I have no doubt it's going to be a stunning game um at least visually but uh the first Ori game came out at like the height of the Metroidvania craze, you know, when it was like super retro. I think I think it may have even come out in this. Did it come out in the same year as Axiom Verge and Guacamelee and stuff? Because it was right around there. I think it was somewhere it was, around that. Yeah. And plus, I'm yeah. confused why we're stuck on Metroidvania. When are we going to take these new styles and make like a Guacamole style Ooh. game? Well, also, I just want to talk about the term Metroidvania. I don't know why. So like, how is it not just a Metroid? Like, where did the Vania come in? Like, I understand that there from was Symphony of the Night. No, I know there's like one game or whatever they went out there and they did exactly what Metroid had been doing forever. But like, how did they get the same status, such as to to join to, to join into a Metroid portmanteau? Hadn't done it for ages. Yeah, it should be Metroid like. Like, we don't call them Rogue Net Hack likes. Some people do distinguish uh, Metroid likes and Igavanias, but I think most people just refer to them as all the same. Yeah, I've I've come to terms with it, but uh, it's a little pet peeve. We could split hairs about genres. All <laughs> I day. know, I know. I mean, they're all just different forms of idle games, right? I suppose no. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, idle games! Oh man, have I been yeah. reading a lot about those? That's a future episode, but. Um... Uh, yeah, idle games get real messy when you try to go in and, and define them, but I'll, I'll save that for now. Yeah. Uh, as for now, next on our list is Apex Legends. What do you fellas think? Ajax. <laughs> uh, you know, at the end of 2018, I was really excited for this game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. it just, uh, yeah, the pre-reviews were good. The PR campaign leading up where it was like nine to 12 months of lead time was awesome. You were just salivating at every new detail that was released. And then yeah. suddenly it was like February 12th, and there it was. Right, That's by the time it comes so, out, you forget about the, the pre-purchase you made a year yep. ago. Oh, yeah, I, so I pre-ordered like a GameStop. Say, I'd like to propose we talk about this still in terms of games we're looking forward to in, in 2019. Uh, in Especially in the context of what 
live games are these days. Oh, yeah. You know, this is going to be a game that evolves and changes over time. And I'm excited to see how that happens. Totally. Yeah. And and I think, um, yeah, the, the majority, I mean, Kingdom Hearts, for instance, may be a game that you finish, but I think the majority of my, my Apex Legends play still lies ahead of me in 2019. Um, I feel so, I feel almost bad for Treyarch and the Call <laughs> of Duty team because man we were we were all over Blackout yeah and I feel like this is stolen its thunder. Well, I think maybe most if definitely. there's someone to feel bad for, and it's too early to tell, and Fortnite is is a behemoth, um, and I, I don't think it's going anywhere. But the fact that it's free to play, um, and the fact mm-hmm. that there are a lot of holdouts for Fortnite, I mean, our group included, we. Um, you know, hit PUBG pretty hard a couple years ago and then sort of skipped over Fortnite. Uh, and, you know, Blackout was finally like the game that came closest to what we were looking for. And then Apex, you know, took that away. So, yeah, it's a bummer for Blackout, yeah. but I think it's, um, you know, it's also kind of got Fortnite in the crosshairs because of the monetization. Yeah. I think I... the youths are all still up in the Fortnite. I, there are youths on uh... the youths. Uh, on the Ajax Legends, yeah, I think uh, you, g- sorry, great. given the Youths. given the folk you know position of this podcast, we talked about game of the year earlier. But in terms of games we're looking forward to, I think this game just needs to find its staying power because we could find ourselves uh, talking about this game again in game of the year. But that depends on basically what happens because it did come as a total surprise with no warning and no expectations. And now it, you know, it can only um, get, get better or worse, and it's really up to the developers and what they, mm-hmm. what they do with the game, because it could, it could just be the total surprise, which I think would lend itself to a game of the year type discussion of where does something like this come from, how does this happen, and it's so good, but it has to survive and you know keep capitalizing yeah. on the success. I wonder if we see other other companies trying this sort of out of nowhere launch strategy yeah no i'm sure somebody will try it is interesting because people are going to complain about anything and everything as long as there is something to complain about and uh (laughs) if you don't if you don't tell already complaining about apex legends not having a ton of new contents in its third week well there you go but like the end game (laughs) dead dead game there's no apex legends had been uh releasing information about its development for a year, two years, then there would have been things to complain about. And they avoided two years of complaints by just not saying anything. I want to like give a shout out to Fortnite because a lot of, a lot of people get jaded about games, not changing very much over the years, but Fortnite pushed the needle so far in terms of what people expect in terms of consistent updates to games that it has flipped everything on its head in terms of that if you're not having an update almost every week your moves are weak yeah yeah maybe yeah. i mean they definitely have sent uh set up uh i'm trying to avoid the word cadence because uh, i don't know if we're allowed to say that anymore <laughs> um but frequency uh, yeah a, a frequency uh uh yeah um that yeah. people are expecting and that. I... People are going to have to learn that not every game can and will do that. Uh, But it's, you know, for the games that can and that can deliver it, it, people are going to flock to them. Yeah. And that said, I mean, they already have their first uh, new weapon, uh, which I was surprised to see Mm -hmm. like two weeks after their launch. Um, So it it seems like they're setting up to do that. Uh, As for me, there's still enough to learn in the game. Like I've, I've really only kind of deep dived on one character so far like there's uh now i'm watching videos on like these crazy hook shot things with the robot dude um i think the game has some depth just with what's already there uh not to mention that like the meta is going to keep changing and um so i i think it's way too early to begin complaining about new content when the content that's been dropped is deep enough like people should go explore i think if you think it's too early allow me to introduce you to red oh yeah like, welcome to the internet. Yeah, I love that. People I love that much, place. People have too much time on their hands. If you know, it's like go all in lifestyle gaming on a game that's been out three weeks and there's nothing new for a, for a surprise. To the, like, uh, oh man. The best to part that point, is. Go sorry. ahead, Troy. 
I was just going to say, no game has made me feel like a dad more than Ajax, or Apex, sorry. What's the name? Apex Legends? There we it's go. Best, the, best name in A. <laughs> best name in A, yeah. Because as we log on and we play Thursdays and Mondays, you know, my four kills on Mirage or the one I like, Bangladesh or Bangalore, Bangalore and then we're playing up against other people and they're loading into the game, and it's like, 2300 kills <laughs> this is like this yeah. game's been out for two weeks some people yeah. hit it hard and it, it's also funny when you get somebody who's like gets on mic and starts um you know telling you things about what you're not doing right or like you need to break off or that, that happened in the game with me and was and it's like uh this is my second time playing bro this is most people's second time playing you know, um, you were mentioning studios to feel bad for. I feel bad for Gearbox because if they had made Borderlands Battle Royale, they would have made Apex Legends. And it sure. probably would have been pretty good. Like, could you imagine a handsome Jack hosting the most dangerous game, you know, on some island he owns and gets a bunch of people on there to kill each other? You know, it, it would totally work. And I think you're probably a, a fortune teller here. <laughs> there are, like plenty of or a lot of apex in terms of aesthetics down to the the crates and the robot guy like remind me of borderlands and it's a and it's a good thing because i i like that world um and i don't think it's a blatant ripoff and i don't think it's a you know a borrowing or a cloning i think it's a drawing inspiration from but it does almost feel like a missed opportunity for gearbox to establish a game like this in the borderlands world because it would totally work yeah, I guess we'll uh, we'll see. Maybe you will be a fortune teller. Um, and uh, I guess moving on, then we have Doom Eternal. Doom. Will lightning strike twice? I guess is my follow, question. Follow um, the green. This is this would be like the fourth time lightning struck for the Doom franchise. This game is almost in or, like we talked or, about Ori before in terms of like just deliver more of the same. I think Doom is going to need more differentiation than Ori will, but like if they deliver mm. uh, just the, the pace and the feeling, I don't know. Like I think of Doom and Doom 2, the originals, you know, there were so many similarities, but differences about the game, but those two like had enough to be similar, but also stand on their own. And I'm hoping they kind of accomplish that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think Doom 2016 was such a big deal because of just how surprising it was i maybe it still is as great looking back but uh i don't know like the just it's uh it's tone was so neat and interesting yeah. like that that was what was most appealing about me like it, it's fun to play of course but um i don't know if that tone will be as a big deal the second time around I don't know. Doom Eternal has grappling hooks in it, so it can't be that bad. It has yeah. a Jackson or a Torque? The uh, the thing that I thought was most interesting, I always love um, new mechanics or exploring, um, you know, kind of new modes of play. And they're talking about an asymmetric multiplayer mode, which I know has been attempted in many different uh, ways. And we had evolve and some some fly and some fail. Uh, but I actually probably most fail. Porchless. Uh, yep, and one of uh, our research games. Um, but hey, you can put a citation on the video. <laughs> I should. At this point in the <laughs> Go time check so. out our paper. Um, but I, it's going to be um, asymmetric, where some folks are going to take the uh, the monsters, right, the demons, and then some will take the uh, angry doom guy. I guess is the character's name. Uh, and I'm curious to see how that, that rolls out. Left for Dead, of course, is a, a notable example of yeah. somebody who did this well. And I... can they do that again or something even new, newer? Oh, man, I don't know. I I can't be arsed to care about Doom multiplayer. <laughs> like, it just... It's it's the it's the probably the shooter franchise I need it the least from. Like, I, like, I hope it's awesome, right? But, uh... You know that that that's just like the thing I, I don't know. I'm I'm looking at the least in about. Yeah, it. I don't know that I'm gonna play it a lot, but I still, you know, it'd be sure. cool if if we saw innovation there, I guess, and and yeah. you know, a big studio, yeah. um, doing a big effort for that. Uh, you never know what it'll uh, unlock for future right. games. So, I think um, the first one that surprised me so much was the first time I think Gray, Yumi, and Nelson played it on his couch. 
as we were going through that game, I was just like, this is the broiest BS I've ever seen executed in gaming. Like, walk up, rip a, rip a demon skull in half. Oh, yeah, Ugh. for sure. You know, and I was just like, this is the closet, like, this is like the dorm room porn of video gaming. And then, so I went home and I was like, dude, this game sucks. And then the next time we played, we finally got in the pacing of it. And I was like, oh my God, this is so good. And I just, I, by the end, when we finally finished it, you know, we were probably more consistent about that game than any other we had been to try to get to the finish line. So it was just, it was really interesting how the, my perception of that game shifted. Yeah. The... It, it stands out in a sea of just these like super narrative heavy things we've had the last few years. Uh, like even God of War has become this crazy narrative franchise. Like Doom, there is a place for a game like Doom that is just let's f some shit up. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's I think it's easy for fun. in today's world for video games to kind of just like lose a sense of identity, or at least in terms of the scope of the game. You know, when you do a single player and a multiplayer, what kind of multiplayer are you gonna are you gonna do? Or are we talking about a grand cinematic experience on your single player experience? Sometimes you just need to make a fun game. And I think that's where Doom found mm -hmm. success is that it's freaking fun to play. You can just hop in, get violent, uh, you just feel like a bamf. A badass mother save Grey from bleeping out a curse word. Uh, <laughs> just like no, I'm just kidding. You gotta add it. Um, but this is like that game is really, Let's go. really funny or really fun to play because you just feel powerful. Um, you get to have those violent moments, and I don't know. They just did a great job with that. You didn't take it tell mm -hmm. itself too seriously. Didn't try to make be the best single player experience. It didn't try to replicate Doom. It just was a fun game, and it, we need games like that. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll see if they can do it again. Surprise us again. Um, yes, battle royale. <laughs> I hope it does. Then we'll see. <laughs> Ninety nine uh, but... demons versus one entrant. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of FPSs, though, we also have from the uh, the makers of Bioshock or some of that team, uh, Void Bastards. Yeah, we missed a layup when Jared was talking about Borderlands because the art looks almost identical. So. When we all played Borderlands back in the day, I kind of felt it, there was like this trend where quite a few people started to do cell shaded games and you had the Walking Dead series come in after that and all that from Telltale. And it felt like that we were like meet, meeting like peak cell shading. But then looking back, I don't think we actually took advantage of it enough because those are still really, really great and really super fun to look at. I mean, great. I remember when you did the Nono Cube filter that was like the puzzles in cell shading that looked like Borderlands, uh -huh. and I, yeah. that would that would uh, we would be rich now. We messed yeah, it up. Dude. It's just a So Bell filter. <laughs> uh, so Void Bastards though is FPS, looks like Borderlands, but then on top of that, they're throwing more of a strategy and FTL like elements. Yeah. So you kind of control your fleet of expendable du prison dudes throw them into a level and go in and try to get loot and all this sorts of stuff. And then you might win, you might fail. And then that affects your kind of campaign or this is how I'm interpreting from the trailer. And I think that mashup could be really cool. Totally. That, that combination of both the high level uh, tactical, right. And then you, but you still have to execute on the ground, like boots on the ground and first person kind of thing. Um, I don't know how that's going to mix together. And like you, I'm trying to just sort of piece it together from from trailers and stuff I've seen, but that sounds really appealing. Yeah, I um, I like that you explained it as FTL like because I think people would talk about FTL as being a what rogue light or rogue like in some regards. Like we're at a point in terms of video games and genre drawing that. There are so many different amalgamations of different games and styles that are out there that you can kind of pick and choose. It reminds me very much of heavy metal music genres. Like, it's kind of insane how deep that world goes. And you can say, oh, this is a blackened thrash doom uh, melodic tech death metal band. And, you know, that that actually makes sense in terms of the context of the music. And Are you making that the, up? 
Is there uh, rogue? There's only you probably wouldn't use them. that many tags on a band, but like those are real tags on bands and they're on genres. So like we're at a point in video games where you add a dash of this, a little bit of that, like borrow from this game, and there are enough games out there that new combinations feel fresh, and not just from you know a design perspective, but from a gameplay just perspective too. And so this game looks really fun because it seems like it's borrowing from a lot of great elements. And that uh, Bioshock um, uh, DNA, right? It's yeah. Um, I have high it hopes. Has that pedigree? Yeah. So next up, we have uh, Untitled Pokemon game. I'm not sure. There's supposed to be a game coming out this year, but we don't know too much about it. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know that it's been technically 100% confirmed for this year, but everybody at Nintendo has said it's going to be this year. It's going to be the next generation Pokemon game. So Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee were kind of stop gaps to this. Uh, and man, for people who've been playing Pokemon since Red and Blue came out, uh, this is this is a big deal. Like this is this is the flagship Pokemon game on a home console, which has never happened before. The full pokemon rpg experience uh and let's go eevee and pikachu were a taste of that but they were not like the whole shebang with all eight hundred thousand pokemon that exist now everyone's and, here uh yes right on the podcast or uh, in general <laughs> just kidding so, Pikachu. I, I think there's two two ways they could go about it with this pokemon game they could try and uh break the format a little bit more and say oh it's a new mainline entry we're gonna change it up a little or they could say hey it's our first mainline game on a brand new console in the home let's give you that classic experience that you've been asking for for almost no for more than 20 years uh I could see fans of both approaches. I personally kind of just want traditional experience. But uh, either way, I'm looking forward to it. That's cool. Uh, Yeah, I guess I am too. um, As someone who hasn't really played Pokemon and then uh, really jumped in with Go uh, Pikachu um, because of my my son, I, I, man, I don't get it. I mean, the, the, the critters are cute <laughs> and stuff, but, like, the game is just bad. And so I want... It gets fun to play with him because his the, classmates... The core Pokemon RPGs play. have a bunch of stuff. Oh, sure. And, like, he's got Pokemon mm-hmm. books, and he's really excited about knowing all of them and stuff. And so it's fun to see it through his eyes, but, it, like, without that IP, this gameplay is just... Ugh. So I, I want to give it a real Do shot. People like Collectathons. You... I'm guessing collection rpgs are not your jam yeah maybe not I don't, I don't know. uh you don't seem to like pokemon and i know you don't like nino kuni oh uh and that, that's a big thing they have in common okay so what else would be uh, a collection rpg i've never heard that term i just made that up oh Should but I a paper? it's like an rpg where you collect mons no well, let's not say that let's uh <laughs> Um, wow welcome to 2019 boys and girls it's a, it's a, <laughs> a poke like <laughs> <Okay. laughs> uh, uh, but um you know instead of like final fantasy where you're doing with these party members you have the whole time it's you you recruit and change your party members a bunch and you capture the things you fight with i mean that's that is a mechanic that has been reused outside of pokemon I, I couldn't even tell you if Pokemon was the first to do it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. I'm kind of speaking out of my ass a little bit, but um, like that's definitely a kind of RPG. For well, sure. That's all right. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's. I'm. I'm looking forward to giving it a shot, kind of in a, a slightly uh, different form, and and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, and uh, like honestly, people, I feel like underestimate how complicated Pokemon games are. <laughs> uh, and that's one of the things that's awesome about them is they can be so they can be really broadly appealing, but they have depth uh, that's really fun to engage with. Did y'all play Mario RPG back in the day? Oh yeah. Yes. Oh. How would that? Is that the core Pokemon experience you're looking for? 
Well, in Mario RPG, you still have party members that you use, right? Those, yeah. I, yeah. those are completely different games. I mean, yeah. Mario RPG is good in Pokemon. Wow. <laughs> No, Mario RPG, I don't remember. A lot. I mean, there was no collection, um, and you didn't really trade out your party or have any strategy around your party like you do in Pokemon, trying to match up the types. I mean, you didn't you know have to choose a party of four out of, like, seven possible oh, okay. max members, but, yeah, there wasn't a strategy of right. so much. As, yeah, not not the same. Um, and so, but, you know, that I don't mind, because I'm playing uh, Octopath uh, still. I've I picked it up again with a vengeance and uh i'm actually i really do enjoy seeing the challenge that's ahead trying to guess what you need and then creating an optimal party for that out of the the eight so that part i like it's it's probably more in, and we can get into it uh, more in a future podcast or or something but it's the execution of the game just the the total linear storyline the pacing the the actual capture mechanics with the the accelerometer it, it, but yeah, that's the stuff that we would hope we're not going to be in exactly. this Pokemon game this year is is the uh, accelerometer stuff. I would be okay if it's there as an option. Uh, <laughs> there is something approachable about it, and it's the fantasy of like, hey, throw your Pokeball <laughs> with the accelerometer is fun for like the first time you do. Your it. fantasies are like, so okay. different than mine. <laughs> You don't want to throw a plastic ball at something and enslave it? <laughs> not, 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 not usually. Yeah. Well, then we do have different fantasies. <laughs> <I think so. laughs> um, well, I, we have a, a couple of games left. Um, one of them we can just go over briefly, but I thought uh, Among Trees looked, uh, looked real purdy. Um, and I know that some of us are into kind of the it crafting looks like survival. Corey in 3D. It does, but that's that's a good thing. <laughs> I think 2019 is going to be my crafting <laughs> game year, and I'm not going to play any games with y'all anymore. I'm just going to sit in like pretty little crafting games and just do it up. It, this yeah, game looks I'm okay like okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> this game looks like Firewatch crafting simulator because Firewatch is just like so. Even if people criticize it as being the walking simulator game, which kind of, sure, it is, but it tells a story, narrative story. This game has the same art style, but then on top of it, they're going to do a crafting survival genre, and I would love some more of that kind of stuff. Like Again, where... going back to the video game heavy metal genre drawing board, pick, pick and choose from the different piles and make your game, and it works. You know, this game does look really good. Yeah. Is it multiplayer or is it going to be another kind of Subnautica type thing? Because look like there's a I didn't see anything huge on that. amount of info about it. Really, I would I'm really getting love that Subnautica yeah, to to play again. Like I would love to yeah. play Seven Days, but in a world that looks like uh, Among Trees. So I'm keeping my eye out. Um, and we then have uh, Sekiro's uh, Shadows Die Twice. Is a uh, was was looking at that one yeah so from software mm -hmm. has knocked it out of the park for many many years now uh and they're finally doing something different than souls and I, i'm just super curious what it's gonna be uh it, it looks really interesting i've actually been kind of going media silence on this game i i pretty much only know that it exists and it's like some samurai ninja bullshit. Yeah. Uh, My, I... I know it's... Yeah. I'm excited about this, too, just because um, I like the From Software games, and I I think that uh, when you're in a creative space, you don't want to do the same thing over and over and over again. And so in, From Software, like you said, Tim, they found success in the soul space. They made Demons, Dark, 1, 2, 3... And like Bloodborne was a departure aesthetically, mm -hmm. but still was essentially the same style of game. I think it's good yeah. for the studio, and I don't know, you know, how much the studio has grown and if it's the same people or if it's different people, right. a new project. But ultimately, I think for the studio, it's good to make something different, um, to mm -hmm. for the team to do something that's not Dark Souls, for them to explore a new universe, a new style of game, because I think that can only help benefit 
them right. in terms of making a good game this time around, but also when they revisit their old titles like Dark Souls and Bloodborne, they kind of have new ideas and uh, yeah, yeah, just new ideas going into those. So I, I still can very much tell, like the little bit I have seen of the game, like this definitely looks like a From Software game, and it and it definitely has some similarities to Souls, but it definitely changes up the most, like way more than Bloodborne right. did. Even just sure. using a different formula, because Bloodborne was the same formula as Dark Souls, just different aesthetics. So I think making a different type yeah. of game will be good for this game, but also mm -hmm. for Dark Souls 4, or if there's but Bloodborne 2. Bloodborne also had a very different pace than the Souls games. It, uh, it did. I, I, like, it did. I'm not I, trying to say I, that. I'm not going to try and argue that they're not similar, but they're... Like one of the, one of the reasons why I like Bloodborne so much is because they could take the trappings of those Souls games, uh, take the things that they were known for when it came to like the world building and story building and all that, and apply it into like a totally new setting and pace. And it controlled very similar, but I mean, it, they're wildly different to play. Yeah, no, they are. Um, I'm not. I'm not trying just... to sell Bloodborne as Dark Souls 1.5, but I think they're the same type, same genre. And if this game is going to be in a somewhat <laughs> different genre, I think that I think it's good. One of the cool. things I saw on this was that they're trying to make death a little less punishing and almost to be strategic as part of it. So when you die, you can come back immediately, and then that can change the way aggro works and that can change the way like you position in fights and stuff like that. So I think that's kind of interesting relative to, Hey, you get to retread 30 to 45 minutes of trash to mm. go attempt a boss again. It also looks like it's going to be bright, relatively speaking to the souls games. And I think the environment artists at from software are maybe the best anywhere, just in terms of like detail and uh, I don't, don't want to say innovation, but like uh, there's just something about the way they build their environments that is just really interesting. I don't know that it's as, got quite as high fidelity as people like Naughty Dog or something, but exploring the environments in Bloodborne and the Souls games is just that to me is like the coolest part. And seeing them go in this totally different environment in Sekiro is or is it Sekiro? How, does, how do you say it? So many somebody uh, pronounces it's kind of all syllables are the same uh intonation it's it's not necessarily like like you would in english have to put the stress on the first or the second okay no stress on any or equal stress on all syllables yeah and the r kind of sounds a little yeah. more like an l um but uh but yeah sounds sounds cool looking forward to it and this one comes out march just next under a month, month now right? Yes. Uh, whenever you can expect me to leave TNG early <laughs> on, <laughs> mm, whenever that is. I mean, you say that about a lot of games, and you beat them in like two days, so I'm not too worried. Yeah, I'll be back. I'll carry you guys through Apex eventually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hashtag Gary. Thanks, Dad. Um, and the uh, the last game on the list, I don't know much about it. The Outer Worlds. Outer. Fallout's not Fallout. I mean, it's Fallout. I hate to like keep talking about Borderlands, but Fallout or Outer Worlds feels like Fallout meets Borderlands, both in terms of the humor and, and in my opinion, anyway, the humor and the aesthetics. But I'm look the Outer Worlds and Borderlands literally literally mean the same thing. I actually hadn't even connected it with. Oh wow, Borderlands you know what? You just said it. You're, but yeah, it totally makes sense. You're right. Um, and Obsidian is making it, which I'm excited about because they make. Uh, pretty good games. I really liked Fallout New Vegas and Pillars of Eternity. Um, so I, 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 I'm looking forward to the game just by kind of the, the concept of Obsidian making a Fallout Borderlands uh, aesthetically tinged game. I don't really know how it's going to pan out, and I'm not all that familiar with what type of game it's going to be like. Um, you know, is it going to be a Destiny style shooter or a Fallout style game? Um, maybe somebody can actually enlighten me and our I, listeners on that. So it's supposed to be. It's not open world, but it's. Everything else is kind of in the style of 
uh, the Bethesda Fallout games, as far as, as, far as I can tell. Um, you know, it's well, with an emphasis on storytelling, it seems. So it's it's sort of open world. My impression is that they're suggesting it's more like how maybe a Tomb Raider's open world. I'm just maybe I might just be totally wrong there, but it's not like one big open place, but more like places you travel gotcha. to. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if uh, if Bethesda's not going to make a Fallout game, then I suppose we can have an Outer Worlds. Probably uh, in better shape. Yeah. Uh, Troy, I see it on your list. What do you have to say about it? Oh, well, I was thinking when I saw that it was from Obsidian and then it was makers of New Vegas, I distinctly remember when I picked up New Vegas at the Best Buy in South Center, and I texted you, and I was so excited about it, and then I absolutely hated New Vegas. And I tried to play Pillars of Eternity, and I couldn't get past the first hour. And But everyone just loves the studio, and so I know there's got to be something good there. And so mm-hmm. I'm waiting. I, I'm excited to see what Outer Worlds brings in that regard, because I, I tend to play one deep, meaty RPG per year, and I think this one might be the one. Yeah, I definitely like I, New Vegas I, more than Pillars of Eternity, but like I, I don't know. I see what you're saying because they definitely cater to a, I don't want to say a niche audience, but like a little more hardcore than average type audience. Obsidian does, I think. Mm-hmm. I I gotta say my my grievance with Obsidian games has always been, uh, they sometimes it feels like the games have confused having lots of writing as having good writing. Mm. Or, like, interesting things to say. Like, Pillars of Eternity, to me, was just, like, a barrage of stuff. And nothing grabbed my attention. Uh, like, I, it's... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and New Vegas was kind of similar to me, in a way. Like, they just throw out a million things at you, and then you just... You're... you're... I don't know. That's, I mean, and that's their style. Yeah. And again, it might just be a thing I don't like. One of the cool things I read about in this today was that they were talking about how they were going to try to differentiate it via what they called the flaw system. Whereas you will kind of carry scars from your missions and choices you make throughout the games. And I think I made fun of Mass Effect before where, quote unquote, your decisions matter, you know, and they don't really except in very narrow circumstances and cutscenes. Spoilers. Yeah, <laughs> but it sounds like what they're going for here is a more complicated decision tree of how the rest of the game plays out based off of what you do. And I, and I like that idea because I like the example one of the producers gave was, for instance, let's say you have a bad experience with a robot and one of your companions dies, you will have minus 10 to fighting against robots throughout the rest of the game. And while that sounds very like a very heavy penalty i think that could be really interesting from a storytelling standpoint for for this game yeah Yeah, definitely i mean that's also just been their mo right like the types of games that they make um with new vegas that's kind of what made it a somewhat i don't want to say different than the other fallout titles but it set it apart in terms of the decision making mattering um also the pillars of eternity being D D style ish games like your decision ma- uh, making matters and a game like tyranny uh was similar like that one got a lot of critical acclaim for your decision making impacting the plot of the game um so i think it's good i think something like this is in good hands yeah i'm kind of easy for sci-fi rpgs in general that aren't based on existing ip so i'm kind of down I I would love to see what Obsidian does now with uh, not making just old style CRPG things and instead making yeah basically this is this is the spiritual successor to New Vegas mm-hmm. yeah uh, and it yeah it's um and it looks like you know th- they get to add the uh, humor tone it's not I mean Fallout. Mm-hmm. New Vegas definitely had elements of dark humor to it, which kind of made it fun. Uh, but this is a little more overt, you know, right. and tongue in cheek, um, which I think will be to good. To me, this is this feels like the game they've wanted to make for ages. Yeah. 
no, I think if the game feels fun and that comes through, then that means the developers had fun, and that's a that, that's good. It's also probably they pitched Bethesda to let them make a Fallout Four New Vegas style thing, and then they didn't. Oh. <laughs> if I had to hazard a guess, Man. <laughs> I bet some of those ideas are. But this here. wasn't the middle finger to Fallout seventy six, right? A crafting game I probably will not play. <laughs> in 2019 I I don't know I kind of am very curious about Fallout 76 I would get it if I could get it for the right price Yeah, I don't want to spend a ton of money on it but uh, I think the idea in Fallout 76 is pretty ambitious and clearly it sounds like it didn't execute right but um, I don't know it's I still I still want to check it out eventually. I'm in for twenty dollars in a year. The next uh, right. Steam Winter Sale. Yep. All right on. Yeah, sounds promising. Um, so I guess uh, with that we can wrap it up and tell these fine folks out there what you guys are working on uh, and where they can find you, uh, Mister Tim Day. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me in the web, on the web, in the internet. I'm there on Twitter at the T day. Uh, and yeah, I'm working on video games all the time. Nice. Uh, and Jared Newton, where can folks find you? you can find me on Twitter at Jared D Newton. Um, and on this podcast, please give us a like and subscribe because oh. it's, it's been a great experience. Yeah. Like and subscribe. And finally, Troy Edwards, what are you working on? Cray, I'm going to ask you to bleep this out. You can find me at <laughs> Seattle, Washington. <laughs> Why are you making work for me? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that in. Yeah, that's <laughs> at Troy Edwards. Bleep it out, but leave it in the subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right on. Once again, I am Robert C. Gray, and this has been the Academic Gamer Podcast, Episode 4. Our music is by Ozed, and you can find more of his stuff at ozzed.net. Thank you again to everybody for hanging out and for listening. If you like, you can follow us on Twitter at Academic Gamer. Send an email to academicgamer at outlook.com. Questions, comments, concerns, send it all our way. We'll try to address it in the next episode. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. Just search for Academic Gamer. We hope you enjoy the videos that we're posting there. Throw us a like, subscribe, comment, to help us out. And in the meantime, on behalf of myself, Tim, Jared, and Troy, wishing everybody a great week. Game on.